What's the deal with Aokiji? He went from being a loyal marine believing in the rule of law but still acknowledging the flaws in the system to a rogue wanderer trying to find himself to a commander in the Blackbeard Pirates. So many extreme shifts in just a matter of two years. So how did all this happen? Well to answer that we gotta go back to the beginning. In chapter 1087 we get a few panels about Kuzan's younger years, just starting out as Garp's protege. Garp being Garp devises the most alpha training method of all time using battleships as punching bags. And interestingly Haki wasn't allowed so it was straight hands. But Kuzan mentions he couldn't use Haki even if he wanted to, which is surprising because earlier he said that the other marine instructors taught him all they could already and he wanted to reach the next level. Which either means they couldn't teach him the level of Haki he wanted or they straight up couldn't teach Haki. Which either way don't bode well for the competency of the marines. This and just the story in general makes it seem like the upper brass very much favor quantity over quality and rely on purely outnumbering most of their opponents, not even being able to train one of their best prospects in a young Kuzan in something as essential as Haki. This is further shown by their campaigns for recruiting the new admirals Green Bull and Fujitora by holding a world military draft instead of training their own vice admirals for the position or even having vice admirals with enough strength to take the position already. I mean, isn't it strange that there weren't any vice admirals on that level? Despite having presumably years to train to take the place of one of the admirals, it makes it seem like the military either gives no incentive for these vice admirals to do that or give them so much work they can hardly have any time to train, which shows a lot of incompetence as I said and the mentality that they can just throw more troops at the problem. One vice admiral not enough, have a buster call. Buster call not enough, have a double buster call and an admiral. That should take care of it, but just in case, we'll send one of our own guys to make sure it's done right. The ego and superiority complex just emanates from everything involving the world government and navy and the reason I've given these examples is important. All these flaws and cracks in the navy shown throughout Kuzan's life build up to the eventual breaking point we'll talk about later. The next time we see Kuzan is much later on when he's worked his way up to the position of vice admiral, being one of the five ordered to conduct a buster call in Ohara, the leading island for study and research in the world. There he meets his friend Jaguar D. Saul. It isn't apparent at the time but looking back Saul really was one of the only friends it seems like Kuzan had. The only other people close to that being Garb and Smoker. The first panel we see him in, he attacks Saul, but if we take a closer look, he actually attacks right when an order was given for one of the navy battleships to open fire on Saul, actually preventing him from taking a lot more damage. This is our first hint, very subtly on Oda's part, that Kuzan is doing everything in his power to prevent Saul's death. Next we get a conversation between the two. Saul pleads with his friend to see the horrific nature of this attack, but Kuzan still at this point believing in the marines and world government says that this attack is for the greater good. He says that the scholars are breaking the law. And it almost sounds like something the higher ups told the vice admirals in a briefing before the attack, priming them, getting them to buy into their propaganda, which they very much use on their own officers as much as they do with the general population. Kuzan then makes an interesting point that Saul's definition of justice may differ from his own, and he won't fault him for that, or act like his definition is the right one. But if he gets in the way of his mission, he can't leave him be. But just then, another sect of justice appears. Vice Admiral Sakazuki, later known as Akainu, destroys a ship carrying all the evacuated civilians from the island. The people who were promised safety if they complied, innocent people, children, all killed for the sake of this brand of justice. And although not completely aligned, this is probably the closest form of justice to what the celestial dragons believe. And this slowly sinks in for Kuzan. His initial reaction is horror, and when questioned by Saul, he insists his brand of justice is different, which it is, but at the end of the day, if you stand side to side with someone who does these things, same rank, same mission, same outcome at the end of it all, would someone watching this event unfold really be able to tell the difference between the two of you? I'm not so sure. Kuzan then starts freezing Saul in a time capsule, and this is where Kuzan has a choice. He's at a crossroads, kill his friend and an innocent child or let them both go. He of course chooses the latter, but it's really interesting to think about what he would have done if Sakazuki didn't do what he did, because I truly believe that action was a life changing event for Kuzan, and made this choice swing one very clear way. He tells Robin, sometimes absolute justice can drive someone insane, and from this point on, Kuzan was absolutely determined to not be the next one driven insane by this justice. He let the seed that Saul protected go, and though he doesn't show it much, the tragedy at Ohara was the single most impactful moment of Kuzan's entire life. And I know I'm getting a bit ahead, but I want to recount what Kuzan said about this event years later, after he left the marines in a bar at his lowest point. All I remember was a good friend fighting back against the government, and the sad lonely eyes of a little girl whose fate rested in the palm of my hand. Ohara meant everything to Kuzan. It's the single largest driving factor for him in the current story, but we'll revisit that later on.
The next time we see Kuzan is, well, the first time. He appears at the end of Long Ring Long Land as our first introduction to a Navy Admiral, one of the three great powerhouses of Navy HQ, a beacon of justice to the world. But from our perspective following the Straw Hats, he was a force of nature and incredibly powerful. Both of these standpoints were true, but there was also a lot under the surface. He had reached the second highest position possible, but he sacrificed his freedom for it. He was now a dog of the Celestial Dragons, the architects of this entire flawed world, the ones responsible for Ohara, and an untold number of events just like it that Kuzan could only imagine, lost to history. And now as an admiral, we can be sure that he's been called upon to personally carry out the Celestial Dragons' orders and directly uphold the system. He no longer has plausible deniability, he can't hide behind his superiors anymore. So why? Why would he still stay with the Marines and accept a promotion to the second highest rank after what he saw at Ohara? Well, the only reason I can think of is that he still believed in change. He was mentored by Garp, he knows there's good people in the Marines like him, and although Garp always turned down the promotions, he believed he could use it to facilitate this change. But as far as we can see, it didn't work. Things were stagnant. He was kept busy by the Celestial Dragons, and the only free time we see him having is him checking in on Robin, the only piece of change he was really able to cause. He doesn't show it, but he's desperate to see where Robin ends up. He wants to see if she can change from the person the world forced her to become, and hopes that the world itself can be change too. Well, little did he know, the world would be changed, but not in the way he thought. The war at Marine Ford was the single biggest shift in the world in over 20 years, and Kuzan was right in the middle of it all. He was the first admiral to make a move. He kicked off the war defending the island from Whitebeard's attack and going on the offensive himself. He did a lot during the war. He fought bravely against Whitebeard's forces, defended Navy HQ, did everything he needed to. But the entire time, with all of this context and all these things weighing on his mind, it feels like he was on autopilot. He was still in this place where he just did what he needed to do. He he needed to play his role as admiral for as long as possible to someday maybe get the chance to really change things. And that chance was just around the corner. After the war, the biggest change in his life occurred. He went for the fleet admiral position, which he should have gotten. The previous fleet admiral Sengoku recommended him for it, but of course, Akainu stepped in. He doesn't believe in Kuzan's brand of justice. He still views him as a comrade and doesn't want to fight, but when neither backed down, that was the only option. Kuzan had no choice but to fight him. He fought for 10 days straight, uncharacteristic of a man with a tagline like lazy justice. Justice. But after fighting for so long, after putting everything in, he lost to the man who committed atrocities at Ohara, the man whose actions there have haunted Kuzan since, the man that he said lost his mind to absolute justice. This is when he realizes it. This is when it all clicks. Akainu wasn't everything that was wrong with the Marines. He was the world government's ideal. He wasn't a fluke or unfortunate result, he was the inevitable outcome and not even the final one, because even he wasn't perfect for the government. He still refused to bend the knee and comply to everything, but eventually someone else would rise up with an even stronger sense of justice, who would gladly follow everything the Gorosei ordered, no matter how heinous. It would only get worse from here, and what can you do with a failed, completely broken system? A system you tried for decades to change from the inside. Well, completely reasonably, you leave. You've done everything you can, and all you've gotten back is spit in your face. Face. So off Kuzan went, becoming a wanderer with scars all over his body and a leg blown off, having no idea where to go from there. He met Blackbeard before he was on Punk Hazard post time skip, but I'll cover Punk Hazard first. This was the first time we'd seen Kuzan since the time skip, not counting the mention of his duel. And he comes back with a bang, stopping Doflamingo with ease, who would end up being the major villain of this saga. Again, this is a rare instance of seeing Kuzan with a friend. I know that sounds crazy, but really, he doesn't seem like the type to let people in, but it seems to come naturally with Smoker. I believe the only other time we really see them interact was back in Chapter 594, where Smoker applies for a transfer with Kuzan, which shows he was most likely Smoker's direct contact at HQ, and Kuzan doesn't seem the type to do that for just anyone, especially considering Smoker wasn't even a vice admiral yet, and there were hundreds of marines higher ranked than him that Kuzan would be in charge of. Back to Punk Hazard, Doflamingo delivers a really interesting line, and he has been shown to be one of the most intelligent and perceptive characters in the series. He says that the face of a mere wanderer and that of a man with determination are quite different, implying Kuzan is still very much determined and working behind the scenes towards his goals, under the veil of just being a wanderer. I do believe this to be true, especially after the time skip, but we'll get back to my theories later. In his conversation with Smoker, Kuzan says that from the start he didn't think the world government was the end all be all, and many things became clear after leaving the marines. This reveals a lot, we clearly see he was loyal to the marines and believed in the rule of law, even supporting it during Ohara, but apparently in the back of his mind he knew the system was flawed and had to be overthrown eventually, but everything that's happened up until this point has shown him that it had to be done now, rather than decades or centuries in the future. Very interesting perspective that 
that I and I'm sure many of you hold for certain topics. We see flaws in how the world works and think that's not right and it'll have to stop eventually, sometime. But as we get more perspective on how dire some of these situations are, that eventually seems like it has to come sooner and sooner. He leaves Smoker with a dire message about how Doflamingo is a different threat compared to the other warlords and could lead to the most dire situation that Kainu's government has faced thus far. At the time of reading this, it just seems like this was meant to display Doflamingo's power or even influence, and while that is true, his connection with the Smile Fruits and Kaido, eventually threatening to start a world war, were definitely part of Kuzan's concern. Another concern was not yet known to us, Doflamingo's connection to the Celestial Dragons. It could be assumed Kuzan knew about this all along, and while that in and of itself is concerning, I think he knew more, that Doflamingo had this piece of blackmail that could impact the entire world if it came out, and I think that was the main thing he was referencing. He's thinking on a much larger scale, with his main concerns being the Celestial Dragons, and I think they're at the center of his plans. Now we finally get into the meeting between Blackbeard and Kuzan. He just lost to Akainu the previous year, but as we see, he hasn't lost any of his insane power, freezing a chunk of Blackbeard's crew, including Sanwan Wolf, one of his commanders. Long story short, Kuzan decides to unfreeze them and have a chat with them at the bar. He cracks some jokes, he hasn't lost his sense of humor, and things are going alright. He even breaks his leg as a party trick, which is pretty wild. And then they talk about the Poneglyphs for a while, but that's not too relevant to Kuzan's story at the moment, so I'll just skip it for now. But it leads into the quote I mentioned earlier. But then Lafitte has to talk about stealing Kuzan's fruit, which of course pisses him off. Off and he starts going off on everyone, but Blackbeard starts pleading with him to join his crew. And at first, Kuzan isn't convinced, but Blackbeard delivers a very simple argument. His crew isn't together for fun, they all came together because they have their own goals and can work towards them easier by being a collective. He then tells Kuzan he's free and asks him what he wants to do. Now this is very powerful. It's completely true and while I'm sure Kuzan thought this himself, that's one of the reasons he left the marines to be free. To hear from an outside source must have been very liberating, even if that outside source was Blackbeard. And being asked what he wants to do for the first time in his life instead of being told what's right and what's wrong, I believe really might have endeared him to Blackbeard. But now we move on to the big one, the confrontation between the former student and master. One of my favorite tropes in manga if done well, which here it undeniably was. The first thing Garp tells him is to get back in uniform, but Kuzan responds that he's decided to live on his own terms. For the first time in his life, he can truly make his own decisions. Then, as he's slamming him into the ground, Garp says that only weaklings lose their way. At first reading this, I didn't think much of it, but after the research and looking back on everything during this video, I really hate this line. It shows everything wrong with the marines, and what Kuzan is finally broken free from. The idea that the marines are the correct side, and even though the government has flaws, it's always right to stand against pirates, and that's just wrong. Kuzan didn't lose his way, he's found himself more in the past year than he has in his entire life. He's finally free and doing what he truly wants, working to bring down the system that produced the horrors of Ohara and countless other atrocities purposefully lost to history. But to ignore all that, act like Kuzan's a spoiled little kid that left because he lost his way, not because of decades of buildup and careful consideration, countless sleepless nights being haunted by what he's seen and what he's had to do, desperately looking for a solution and coming to believe this is the only way. Look, I like Garb, but this wasn't it. Maybe I'm missing something, but to disregard and talk down to your protege and your friend just for having a different perspective than you, believing he made this choice on a whim, lightly, just doesn't make sense. And maybe that's just it. Maybe more will be revealed later to add context to this, because as of right now, Garp's blind loyalty to the Marines is getting a bit tiring. It cuts away, and when we come back, Garp gets stabbed by Shiryu in an effort to save Kobe, and him and Kuzan go back at it. They do the classic dual punch, which knocks them both down, and when they both get back, up, Kuzan shows concern, but Garp, in true Garp fashion, says that proves he's still soft and knocks him down again and goes on a rampage, and in the end sacrifices himself for the next generation. It fades out with Garp laughing and Kuzan looking absolutely devastated. So here we are, with all the context. So, what's up with Aokiji? Is he really a Blackbeard pirate, or is the popular theory of him being a double agent true? Well, both these are very much possible and I swing between both these a lot. On the side of him genuinely being a part of the Blackbeard Pirates, he could just be tired of it all. He wants to make his way in the world and finally forge his own path, free, truly free, to do what he wants after decades of being under the thumb of oppression of the world government, under constant vigilance and all of this being exacerbated during his time as an admiral. But in his mind, this would all be worth it. All of the horrible things he had to do would pay off if he could just become the next fleet admiral and really make some changes. But no, he lost. And that reinforced everything wrong with the system. So he fairly departed from that system. 
Maybe Blackbeard really did convince him with the line that his crewmates all had their own goals and they were together to make those goals easier to accomplish. This could be what Kuzan's going for. As Blackbeard's most trusted advisor seemingly, he has a lot of sway and Blackbeard truly does respect Kuzan. It could be as simple as having a bond with an emperor's crew to convince Blackbeard to ally with, say, the revolutionaries when the final war comes, but I don't believe he's truly 100% on board with Blackbeard. Teach, while Kuzan's been on his crew, has tried to sell slaves to Marijua, something antithetical to Kuzan's entire worldview at this point. So however you slice it, at best, Kuzan's loyal to Blackbeard temporarily. A truly even relationship where both know the other will betray them the moment one can no longer gain from the other. Kuzan knows Blackbeard will have to be put down at some point, so he could be biding his time. But if we do assume he's already a double agent, who too? The only three options I can see are the Marines, another pirate crew, or the revolutionaries. Or he could just be working by himself or with a few other people, which doesn't really count as being a double agent really. So let's review the options. First, the Marines. This is the least likely. A popular theory is that he's working with S.W.O.R.D., but I just don't see it. After everything we've talked about and how hard that decision to finally leave was, I don't see him going back. Unless this whole time he's never actually left, which would be strange since I assume Garp would know about that. And before you say, oh, they were putting on an act. Bro, it's Garp. He's not putting on a Shakespeare in performance like that. So ultimately, I'm not convinced, but as with everything in One Piece, it's definitely possible if we get some vital plot twists. Next up, a different pirate crew. To me, the only real option is Shanks. He's got a huge history with Blackbeard and he's on his mind 24-7 rent free. Even right before fighting Kid, Blackbeard was still on this man's mind, so it makes a lot of sense that he wants someone on the inside to be a spy for him, and would explain how he gets any and all information on Blackbeard's moves. Out of all relevant pirate groups, Shanks's would make the most sense. They seem to share similar ideals. Shanks is established, well respected and powerful, and has connections to the Gorosei as well. This would make Shanks aspire for Kuzan as much as Kuzan is for Shanks. This is very interesting and could play out in a lot of ways. I like this theory, but there's still questions. Is this really the end-all be-all Kuzan referenced before, working with a pirate crew? Nah, I think even if he's working with Shanks, everything leads back to one place, the revolutionaries. They're the only current answer to solve all of Kuzan's grievances with the world. They're established and very much on their way to begin the final war. From their point of view, Kuzan has plenty of vital insider information from his time as Admiral, and he could have even helped plan the raid on Marijua, giving them the information about the Celestial Dragon's food supply and much more. So why would they have him work with Blackbeard instead of fully joining them and giving all of his focus to them, even secretly, since he wouldn't necessarily have to expose himself just to be at HQ advising them? What do they need from Blackbeard? Well, I think it's two main things. Number one, the Poneglyphs. Dragon, being a marine in the golden age of piracy, knows the importance of the One Piece, and one of the revolutionaries' objectives is almost certainly to either get to the One Piece or prevent it falling into the wrong hands. And this brings me to my second reason. We all know the similarities and connections between Blackbeard and Rox D. Zebek, and if you you don't, the most obvious one is Blackbeard's ship, which he named the Saber of Zebek. As far as we know, though this could change, the perception of Zebek throughout the world is that he was a power-hungry lunatic, threatening to take over the entire world. And my goat Whitebeard didn't seem to have that high of an opinion of him either, so this was probably at least partially accurate. So if Blackbeard ends up being the second coming of a monster like that, it wouldn't be much of a stretch to assume the revolutionaries would want an inside man monitoring him, when he can easily report back and work with them remotely in his free time anyway. So my theory is a combination of a few things we discussed. To sum it up, I think Kuzan left the Marines because of the atrocities they've committed and him being unable to change things from the inside despite decades of trying. He then got contacted by the revolutionaries, they verified he really wasn't an agent of the world government still, and he started advising them. He then met Blackbeard, either on purpose going to a bar where he knew Blackbeard's crew was, or just by chance, and Blackbeard offered him a spot on his crew. As I said, I'm not sure if he planned it out or if this was all by chance, but either way, he reports back to the revolutionaries about this offer, they weigh the option and tell him to take it. He advises and fights for Blackbeard while relaying information to the revolutionaries. Now he also might be relaying it to Shanks since he probably knows Shanks' character and that he wants to stop Blackbeard too, but if that's too much for him to handle, he could just be solely reporting back to the revolutionaries too, either way is fine. Now he's in a position where, to prove his loyalty to Blackbeard, he had to capture one of his only friends and mentor Garp, and soon Blackbeard might put him to the ultimate test, kill Garp to see whether he's truly loyal. And I think at that point he'll have no choice but to back down, and his real allegiances will be revealed to us. I'm really curious to see where Garp would go from this point, realizing Kuzan's not working for a horrible pirate but rather his own son Dragon. Will this finally be the point where everything clicks for him, that the world government needs to be taken down for true justice to reign? I think it could be, but we'll talk about that in a future Garp video. For now, I'll leave it at this. I hope you all enjoyed, if you made it this far, you probably want to subscribe to me to see my future videos, and that would help me more than you know. I'm trying to get to 1k by the end of the year, and every little bit counts. 
Thanks again and peace out.